I thought I'd take an opportunity to look at uh, one of the passages of Scripture that we often read. I'm just going to look at the, the story of the Pearl of Great Price. It's in um, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. If you've got the notes, uh, which are linked to on Facebook, uh, and they're also on the Good Shepherd website, then uh, you'll, you'll see the passage there. I'll read it very quickly, just so we've all got it. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It's a parable we've heard, gosh, I don't know how long and how many times. Uh, we've heard that one. It's, it's often paired with the, the pearl of great value. Um, but I wanted to, to bring some other uh, thoughts forward, perhaps, that come from different interpreters different times in history different people telling the story even so the first thing i thought was worth uh mentioning is that there's an equivalent parable not exactly the same in the gospel of thomas now some people are of the opinion that the gospel of thomas is a really reliable source for what jesus had to say uh, and he taught and that it was a it, it was a good place to go to from 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 what I've read from other people, uh, to me it feels like it's actually quite a late source when it comes to these sorts of things. Uh, it's got a very strong Gnostic flavor to it, um, but Christian Gnosticism took a while to kind of yeah, get going. Uh, and certainly none of the early uh, commentators take uh, the Gospel of Thomas overly seriously. So um, I don't think we should necessarily give it the same weight as the Gospels. But for tonight, I thought it'd be interesting to read what the Gospel of Thomas had to say about uh, that parable, the, the parable of the price of great, uh, the treasure of great value. Ooh, I can do this. I can do this. Um, so it's saying 109 in the Gospel of Thomas. If you want to grab the Gospel of Thomas, you can just Google it. It's, it's all online. Um, not like in the Da Vinci Code where it's this big, mysterious secret. I mean, Google knows it. So, Jesus said, The probably Father's kingdom is like a person who had a treasure hidden in his field, but did not know it. And when he died, he left it to his son. The son did not know about it either. He took over the field and sold it. The buyer went ploughing, discovered the treasure, and began to lend money at interest to whomever he wished. Now, you can see that there's a, a kind of, it's similar, it's working with this idea, this treasure hidden in a field, but it's also quite different. Uh, it's quite, quite striking in a number of ways. So the first thing, of course, is that in the Gospel of Thomas, um, there's kind of this, this uh, there's the treasure and the person who owes it doesn't know that there's treasure there. Then the next person doesn't know that there's treasure there. And so you have to wonder, they own this field, but they're not plowing it. And there's an immediate question, why not? And then the son sells the treasure. person buy, who buys the field goes and plows it. So they come across the treasure. And then what they do is they start to lend money at interest to whomever they wish or whomever he wished. Um, and of course, for, for a Jewish person to lend money at interest to, to somebody within the community was considered deeply inappropriate. So we have this notion that the person who's buying the field uh, is not particularly godly. Uh, so... Yeah, we, we don't know who in that parable uh, you know, is like the, the kingdom of heaven. And I think it's a very interesting thing just to be aware of. Um, I prefer the, the gospel version myself. But uh, 
yeah, you may find some something interesting there. Oh, if you've got the notes, I also found a beautiful picture of the two paired parables uh, from the Scots Church in Melbourne. Um, there's the treasure hidden in a field and the pearl of great price. And um, I just think it's fascinating how Christian artists in various different ways depict these parables. It's beautiful. Okay, so the next, um, I'm going to say interpretation, but it's not really, is I actually want to read to you a little bit from the story of Ruth. Now, there's a reason for that. And as I read through it, I'm pretty sure it'll become obvious. Now, obviously, Ruth is not an interpretation or a retelling of Jesus' parable, um, because Ruth predates Jesus. Uh, but there, there is a strong echo there. And one of the very interesting things in Scripture is where we get these echoes, these ideas that echo backwards and forwards. And so we can ask ourselves a question, is Jesus deliberately uh, recalling the story of Ruth when he talks about the kingdom of God? And I'll read the story, and uh, I'll lay out why I think that that's a strong possibility. We don't know for sure, of course, but I think, I think it's at least a case that can be made. So this is from Ruth chapter 4, uh, verse 1 to 13. Um, no sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there, than the next of kin, of whom Boaz had spoken, came passing by. So Boaz said, Come over, friend, sit down here. And he went over and sat down. He then said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me, so that I may know, for there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. Then he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. At this, the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belongs to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Marlon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Marlon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gates of, of his native place. Today you are witnesses. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Now, I know that's quite a long passage to, to read for this study. But to remind you, in the story of Ruth, Boaz first meets Ruth in a field. He finds her in a field. Now, it's a field that, that's his, but a field can, can sort of slide around. The meaning of the field here can slide around. So Boaz meets Ruth in a field. He discovers that she's a treasure. She's a hard-working, honest woman. She's got all these really good qualities about her. So then he organizes to buy the field that is associated with Ruth. Um, and to give you some background, uh, look, it was part of the, the family code of support that in, in ancient times, when, when somebody died, when a man died, his wife would be married to someone else in the family so that she wouldn't be without someone to take care of her. But it also, as we read here, maintained some of the name. So there's this kind of long, it's a fairly complex sort of uh, piece of religious code, but it's, it was essentially about keeping people safe. It was a, it was a way of doing community care, uh, which I think is quite beautiful. It, we wouldn't do it these days. We wouldn't do it these days. Um, but it's a great structure for making sure that people are taken care of. So Boaz goes and he buys the field and he gets the treasure, who is Ruth who is also the grandmother of David, who's a Moabite. So we have this picture that the treasure in the field, the kingdom of God, is in fact um, a Moabite woman 
uh, who has demonstrated great uh, integrity and courage and devotion. So if we read that kind of as Jesus, at least referencing the story of Ruth, we get this idea that perhaps is different from some of the others that we might have had. But hey, we now have a, a piece of intertextuality, I think it's called, um, where, 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 where Ruth is the treasure that Jesus is talking about. Ruth, who's the outsider, is the treasure that is God's kingdom, or represents the treasure that is God's kingdom. And so we start to get some of this very political message of the kingdom of God. If we, uh, if we think that Jesus knew his Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, obviously he didn't, uh, knew it pretty well. And scripture seems to indicate he knew his Old Testament pretty darn well. So that's my argument that, um, at least to a certain extent, Jesus is referencing Ruth there. Um, so we've had Matthew, we've had the Gospel of Thomas, we've had Ruth. Uh, we're going to shoot forward a little in time, and I wanted to pick up um, two of the ancient church fathers' workings with this parable, partially because they worked with parables and gospel scripture in a way that we don't do as much these days, and I find it interesting. I'm not necessarily going to change to the way they did things, but I find it interesting, and I hope you find it interesting too. Okay, so where was I? Uh, Irenaeus. Now, um, he's famous for writing uh, what was called Against Heresies. And it's his writings that actually teach us quite a lot about what were the heresies uh, of his time. And in his book, Book 4, Chapter 26, uh, the treasure hidden in... The treasure is Christ. Uh, and it, the, the field is the scriptures. Um, and so the true lens of scripture, the true meaning of scripture is uh, then in the church. So because that's the only place you can truly find Christ in the scriptures. That's uh, Irenaeus' teaching. In, so he has his words. If anyone, therefore, reads the scriptures with attention, he will find in them an account of Christ and a foreshadowing of the new calling. The new calling is to be a Christian, the follower of the way. For Christ is the treasure which was hid in the field. That is, in this world, for the field is the world. Uh, but the treasure hid in the scriptures is Christ, since he was pointed out by means of types and parables. So he's, you know how, yeah, he's playing some funny games there with, um, the, where, what the field is and, and what the treasure is. So the scriptures, the scriptures are, are, are the treasure, Christ is the treasure, uh, and we find Christ in the scriptures, and, but we come to them through the field that is the world. Um, and, and true interpretation is then found in, in the church's teaching of Christ through the scriptures. That was Irenaeus on um, the treasure hidden in the field. Uh, once again, this stuff's all online um, and there's translations too because I think he wrote in Latin and I can't read Latin. So that's a useful thing. Uh, the next person that I wanted to talk about was Origen. Uh, Origen was one of the church fathers, a theologian, church teacher. I'm going to say I think he came from North Africa somewhere um, uh, around Alexandria. Uh, don't quote me on that one, though. Uh, that's one you could probably Google and find the answer to as well. So this is Origen's teaching on uh, the treasure hidden in the field. Here we must inquire separately as to the field and separately as to the treasure hidden in it. And in what way the man who has found this hidden treasure goes away with joy and sells all that he has in order to buy that field. And we must also inquire, what are the things which he sells? The field, indeed, seems to me, according to these things, to be the scripture. So in that regard, he, he agrees, uh, well, no, he because for Irenaeus, 
the treasure is the scriptures. For origin, the treasure is the, 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 the field is the scriptures, uh, which is planted with what is manifest in the words of history and the law and the prophets and the rest of the thoughts. For great and varied is the planting of the words in the whole scripture. You can tell Origen's read some of the Bible and he's found it complicated. Um, and he's, he's saying there's all sorts of different things planted in the field. Uh, but the treasure hidden in the field is the thoughts concealed and lying under that which is manifest of wisdom hidden in a mystery. Even Christ, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Um, so, but another might say that the field is that which is very full, which the Lord blessed, the Christ of God. But the treasure hidden in it is the thing said to have been hidden in Christ by Paul, who says about Christ, in whom are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden? The heavenly things. Therefore, even the kingdom of heaven, as in a figure it is written in the scriptures, which is the kingdom of heaven, or Christ, himself the king of the ages, are the kingdom of heaven, which is likened to a treasure hidden in a field. Um, Origen's not necessarily the clearest person to read or interpret. But what I think what he's doing here is he's bringing out a, a couple of ways of interpreting this. So first, the field is uh, scriptures and the treasure is Christ. But he's also suggesting that the mind of Christ is, is, is the treasure and that's revealed in the scriptures. So it's kind of a double, a double inter a sliding interpretation. Uh, where we get um, this sort of uh, interpretation of the parables. Like I said, some of the church fathers work with parables in ways that we don't necessarily do. Um, although I, I would suggest that that is a perfectly reasonable way of interpreting it um, for that time in history and a, and a way that we would perhaps find useful. It also kind of is very similar to Paul. Um, if you ever want an example of how Paul works with Scripture, the, think about the, the veil uh, that when he talks about the veil with the cover, that covers um, Moses' face, which then covers the mind, which covers the heart, which is then it become, covers the temple. And he moves the veil around in his, in his interpretation of that passage. So Paul was, uh, you know, a, a Jewish thinker. He was a Jewish follower of Christ, but a Jewish thinker. Oh, so that's two of the kind of the older ones. Um, the next one I want to move on to, the next one I want to move on to, uh, is a story by René Girard. Now, René Girard is an anthropologist. Um, I like his work. Uh, um, and he, he often has some interesting insights into things. And he's, he's an anthropologist. But he's very much informed by psychology uh, and um, uh, sort of sociology and all sorts of things. And he, he t says this story, tells this story, and he's clearly working with the parable of Jesus. Uh, I mean, he was a good Catholic theologian, uh, thinker. Um, so he's working with the story of Jesus. He says, a man sets out to discover a treasure he believes is hidden under a stone. He turns over stone after stone, but finds nothing. He grows tired of such futile undertaking, but the treasure is too precious for him to give up. So he begins to look for a stone which is too heavy to lift. He places all his hopes in that stone, and he will waste all his remaining strength on it. See, René Girard there is he's talking about this human capacity to, um, to uh, if we can't, we, we can't give up on the, the dream in a sense. Now, um, you know, so instead what we do is we put the dream uh, in a place where it's, it's too protected by we can't get there, you know. Um, uh, and then we will, so even if uh, the dream is futile, even if this sacred object, this treasure is unattainable, we, what we do is we put too many, too many layers in the way of it so that we can maintain the, the dream of the treasure. And that dream then drives us far more than the practical treasure would. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's kind of a very dark, in a sense, uh, paraphrasing of that story. But at the same time, I think it's worthwhile thinking about. 
Now, these are not the only interpretations of this parable. Um, uh, Amy Jill Levine has some beautiful work um, that's worth thinking about. Uh, and there are many others as well. But I wanted to share these with you partially because they are commentators and thinkers that we don't often come across in church. Uh, we don't often read, say, from the Gospel of Thomas. We don't often think of uh, the parallels between the Old and New Testament. Um, and so I wanted to share these with you. I hope you find that interesting. There's the notes are there. You can always go and have a look for more stuff. Um, and once again, I'm sorry for those who were expecting this to start at 7. Like I said, I forgot I had parish council tonight at 7 via Zoom meeting. So it's now and people can watch it later, as I said. That's the joy of the internet. Anyone have any thoughts or anything that you want to quickly ask? Otherwise, I'll wrap this up. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is I'm storing these all, all these on YouTube and linking to the videos through the website. So uh, if you lose it on Facebook, because um, you know things disappear, you can always go back to it through the website, um, and it's it'll be sitting there. So that's also a possibility. Uh, I think that's it. So I will say. Uh, Oh, Paul saying the search is sacred as is sacred as the treasure. Um, I like that. I feel like that's a very optimistic take on Rene Girard, who sometimes had a very pessimistic take on human beings. So I like that. Um, kind of vaguely. So um, in case I'm not sure if you can see other people's comments, but Paul or Alex has just said that the search is is sacred as is as sacred as the treasure. Um, and I do like that. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. That's a, that's a nice, positive, uplifting thing for us to have a think about as well. Um, so, yes, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.